Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us on this cold and blustery day. Actually, I can't think of anything better to think about and talk about than gardening. And welcome to 2018. I think one of the great things about gardening is every year can be a do-over. Maybe you've decided you're gonna do nothing but purple and red flowers in your garden. Uh, Maybe you need some ideas about the things you want to do this year. Well, we're here to help you out. We always have a great group of people who I'm sure are willing to share their ideas on their do-overs. And um, Marty, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper. And I, shall I do this now, you think? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, that's what I'll do. And I actually brought a little show and tell today. Uh, several of these things. This is bearded wheat, and these are some uh, iris pods. Those are very dry. These other things have a little green on them, and these all came out of my yard about uh, an hour ago. Okay, so you don't, winter, people don't like winter. Oh, I wish it was spring, oh, I wish it was spring. Winter has such a wonderful beauty all its own. And I look out the window at these things, and then you can also cut them like this and bring them and put them in a vase. Um, winter's not just pine cones, although I do love pine cones. This is winter berry. You can grow this in your yard. This is golden cami cypress, gold mops. You've seen it a lot of places in town. This is boxwood. Very common, but nice and green all winter long, so you don't have to see everything brown in the yard. And finally, this is buddleia. This is butterfly bush. This is what it looks like when it's dry. It's kind of silvery, and look how nice they are all together. Just, I mean, it's just a handful. I didn't prune them, didn't trim them up for a vase or anything. So winter is restful. Winter is cozy. Winter doesn't have to be dull. <laughs> so, so good ideas. And I know a lot of times people think about, you know, or ask us about, you know, should I go ahead and prune everything in the fall and all oh. that stuff. But sometimes it really is nice to just leave things up there and really oh, yes. think about that that winter season. So that's great. So thanks. A lot of, great lot ideas, of things Marty. that look so pretty with the snow on them too. Sure, sure. You know, these red berries, oh, they're really yeah. pretty with snow on them. Okay. And Ken, what do we have? Okay. Uh, I have an email and this is from Jake. Uh, he sent it in. Uh, latter part of no, uh, <coughs> December. Uh, it's regards to flower recommendations. And he says that my spouse loves having fresh flowers in the house, but neither of us likes constantly spending money on bouquets. <laughs> well, okay. Um, we're thinking about planting flowers in the spring that we can take cuttings from later in the year. Any recommendations on relatively low maintenance plants that we could get started this spring. Preferably annuals, but we're open to perennial recommendations too. Well, um, first couple things that come to my mind are things that I grow. Um, sunflowers would be a good option. Uh, you can plant those every couple of weeks and you could harvest those throughout the summer into the fall. Uh, if you've got flower beds, say against maybe a privacy fence, you could put those towards the back of up against the fence because they're going to be a taller plant. Uh, zinnias will bloom all from the latter part of June all the way up to frost. And those you can keep cutting and bringing into the home uh, throughout the summer months. Uh, dahlias are another option. Mm -hmm. uh, dahlias work very well in this area. Uh, you will have to dig the tubers in the fall and bring them in. Uh, different types of celosias, um, bachelor buttons. Uh, bachelor buttons would generally be a very early crop. Uh, one of the first ones you want to probably start thinking about in March and April. Um, a lot of these you can start inside or direct seed into the uh, gardens themselves. Uh, with regards to perennials, um, first thing that comes to mind is hydrangeas. Uh, hydrangeas uh, can go in your, make a, you can do a border or like a hedge of hydrangeas. Um, and you can cut on those all summer long up to frost. Um, and as the season progresses, those flowers will change colors. Um, maybe some fall chrysanthemum plants can always be cut, brought in. Uh, and those will come back every year for you. Uh, if you want to get into more shrubs, uh, something taller would perhaps be lilac. Um, so those are some of the perennials that would work out good for 
for cutting and bringing it into your home. Okay. And you want to introduce yourself real quick? So yes, I know? forgot. Because this is kind of your area of yeah. expertise, isn't right. it? <laughs> uh, my name is Kent Miles. I'm from Illinois Willows. We're a specialty cut flower grower in western Champaign County. Uh, we have product 12 months of the year, and uh, we do farmer's markets, uh, wholesale, and um, straight to the consumer. Okay, great, great, great ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I know for me, I have to have an area that, that is for cut flowers. Mm -hmm. Um, because I just will not cut flowers in my regular flower garden. There's just something about, I designed for those flowers to be there and I don't want to cut them, bring it in. So yeah. I have to have a designated area or I'll never do it. So mm -hmm. that's really a good idea for them to be thinking about that yeah, now. I'm yeah. so delighted for them to be blooming in the yard. I don't want to cut them, they look I know, really I don't good. want to cut them. So and you have to have the cut flower garden. So yeah, yeah. And and I love yeah. Are great dry yeah. as well. Yeah. Hydrangeas yeah. So can good come right in. So great. And Teresa, you want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Teresa Mears. I'm a horticulture instructor out at Parkland College here in Champaign and um, greenhouse plants, interior plants, a little bit of a general horticulture, some turf questions. That's kind of my background. I do have a question today from, uh, and I not know, don't know who it's from, but they have wanting to get some new indoor plants. They have a cat, two cats and a dog and they want plants that aren't gonna be poisonous and are pet friendly and such. And I'm gonna caveat this a little bit in saying that even in the most ideal setting, if you get the perfect plant, pets are pets. They still may tear into it. They still may do something. And there are plants that are poisonous that a dog or cat may never touch and you may be fine with and you may have had the mixtures together. So it, it's a little trial and error but I thought I'd pick some plants that I think are easy to grow in interior scapes and are not considered poisonous in any way. But the list goes on, there's lots of things out there. So the parlor palm is a plant that does well interior for people and it doesn't seem to bother the animals. One of my absolute favorites is the aloe. Every home should have an aloe, every kitchen should have an aloe and they're not anything that the plant that animals will bother. A burrow's tail is in the sedum family and most all the sedums seem to be okay. Now you have to be careful when you get to the jades. Jades are sedum-like, but jades can be poisonous to the animals if they do eat them. Spider plants, easy to grow. Very easy to grow. Don't seem to be a problem with the animals. The Hoya plants, which is a little less common, it can be a great vine and it's green, but when it does flower, the common name is wax flower, and it is just a gorgeous plant. Mm -hmm. Interior, you have to watch out for mealybugs, so there is a little challenge with that one. It needs a little more light. The Peperomia family, they do very well. They're smaller plants. They don't get quite as large, so it depends on your space. The Phalaenopsis orchids are the easiest orchid to begin with, mm -hmm. and they're relatively easy. Animals don't seem to be bothered by them. The prayer plants, the maranthas are one that are a little more challenged. They actually like to be a little drier, which in interiors often can be done. Um, and they're not bothered by the plant animals. Swedish ivy, another one that's very nice interior and it grows quite well. So there's lots of different ones out there to start with. But if you kind of stay in some of the fern areas, the palms, the pileas, the sedums, the peperomias, aloes, African violets, all seem to be pretty good and pretty safe for the animals and easy to handle in a home. Um, not recommended, though often seen, are the dracaenas and um, sansevierias, but I've had both and I've had animals and mm -hmm. they don't bother. My, my dracaenas, I had, um, cat would actually strip the leaf with its teeth, <laughs> but didn't eat it, and it never bothered the cat. The cat never got sick from it. So they play with things oh, a little bit, but it, um, think more about what your light conditions are and what kind of plant you can grow and start from there. And start with some of these basic ones, and I think you'll find that you can find something that will fit and work with you in both situations. Okay, great. Some great, great ideas. Uh, one that mm -hmm. I've had really good luck with is actually rosemary. Mm -hmm. I think it's because it's so smelly, oh, you yeah. know, and stuff that when they even get around it, they don't they don't seem to like it. So well, I've got that's hibiscus been, that's in, that's in the really house, good. and it does just yeah. fine. Yeah. And I have cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so always good to think about, though. So okay. thank you very much. And we're going to go ahead and go to our phone lines. And on line two, we have Bob from Decatur. And you have a question about grapevines? So, Bob? 
on line Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, I'm wanting to know uh, when and should I do it every year as far as trimming back by uh, grapevines. Okay, grapevines. What do you think? Not my wheelhouse. <laughs> well, from my end of it, as far as using the grapevines for another purpose, mm -hmm. um, this time of year is good. Yeah, maybe not today or tomorrow. Not today, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But January, February, yeah. Yeah. March. Yeah. Good time. Sure. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So you want to do it when they're dormant? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to have to be done every every year. Because yeah. it really is one it's of those things, isn't it, where grapevines, there's a reason why they make wreaths out of these. It's that you're cutting off like 80% of mm -hmm. the, the yeah. vine itself. Yeah. So yeah. you have to do a lot of trimming on them to keep them productive. Though, if you're, don't you? Yeah, if you're pruning for fruit production, it, it's going to look like you just butchered it and it's never going to live. But it will. Um, a, little, uh, a little research on your part is, is going to take you a long way. Um, a book or do some internet research if you'd like. Um, it's it's basically a T or a double T uh, arrangement. You have to have something heavy to support the vines because when you do that, the grapes only come on the new growth. So if you want fruit production and not just shade, um, you're gonna have to prune every year. Right. Yeah. And actually, you by Extension has a really good book on uh, growing small fruits in mm -hmm. the home orchard. Sure. And if you go on to you by Extension's the website <laughs> to their to, and go to publications, and I think it's only about five or six bucks. It's yeah. really nice. But it, ha it details how to prune grapes. So yeah, so mm -hmm. good good idea. Know what you're doing. So great. Something to do every year. Mm -hmm. And on line three, we have and Jerry from reads. Kansasville. <laughs> uh, you have a question about mushrooms. This is Jerry Dixon. Hi. How are you? I'm doing real good, other than the weather is real bad. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's cold. My question is, we bought seven acres down all uh, three miles from the river down on Silver Creek Road. Um, they have power lines down there, and they've sprayed a chemical on there to kill everything. I'm sure it kills the morel mushrooms. I was curious if you do know how long it would take for them to come back. Um, wow. If they ever would. I don't know. Do you think a herbicide? I don't know how much a herbicide actually affects some of the fungi. A fungi. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I had never really either. good. Yeah, that's a really no. good question. It's yeah. not like they grow from a base every year. They have to drop spores, and then you get a new yeah. plant every year. I I don't think I've ever even heard that question. You get the prize. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm it not, is. So I'm it may sure. not be as bad. It may not be as bad as you might think. Yeah, but the, um, the condition, what they grow in, though. Yeah, is that's gone. the only thing I wondered yeah. about. So what they're growing on, you know, yeah. then decay, and then the conditions, as but in how the, moist it is, and, and stuff no might shade. change, and and yeah, all those kinds of things. Yeah. The conditions might change, but I suspect the the mushrooms itself will still be there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah whether they're on the edge yeah. of wherever yeah. they sprayed, because right. it's probably a pathway that they've right. sprayed. Right. Yeah, so, good, so good question. So hopefully it still works out for you. So yeah, good question. And if they're clear cutting, then the mushrooms aren't going to grow back there anyway. They don't want sun. They want a little little bit of a more woodland area. So if you're lucky, the spores might wash away from into into the edges where there's still some shade. Right. So conditions are Just right. Have to look, yeah. yeah. And I think the interesting thing about mushrooms is that sometimes people don't always realize is that the mushrooms are actually like the, the apple on the tree. They're actually the fruiting structure and mm -hmm. the and the, the fungi itself is actually underground or typically mm -hmm. in a tree in a dead tree or something mm -hmm. like that. So oh, yeah. we don't always realize that it's still there even though you may not see the mushrooms themselves. Mm -hmm. But good question. Uh, and on line four we have Fred, he has a from Urbana and you have a question about amaryllis. I love amaryllis. Yes, hi. I have uh, several amaryllis plants, which I uh, set out every spring uh, in their original pots uh, where I've kept them in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I leave them outside and water them periodically. In the fall, I, I um, uh, cut them back. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, I cut them back in October, let them dry good, bring them inside. And um, uh, this year, I followed all the normal procedures, uh, November 1st or so, they were inside, and they've all come up, except none of them have produced a bud bloom. Uh, they're all just the green leaves, so I'm hmm. wondering what I did wrong. Have you repotted them into a larger pot? There you go. Amaryllis uh, actually like to be pot-bound. They do. Very tight into the pot. And repotted every year. So if they're in too large of a pot, they tend to put more vegetative growth out and don't put the flower out. I see, I see. Well, they're 
kind of the same pots I think I've used for a while. So they same they are bigger than what they come in. I know they come in much smaller pots, but uh, yeah. uh, they've uh, last year about half of them bloomed, half of them didn't. And uh, uh, so, uh, but this year uh, uh, they've come up with the green leaves, but that's about it. There's no flower uh, uh, bulb or uh, of you call stalk anyway, and uh, mm-hmm. so you think they should have gone in a much smaller container than is what you're saying. They, you should be able to just kind of put your fingers between the bulb and the pot, just enough soil that the soil there's soil there to hold the pot, the yeah. bulb, and the bulb plant's high, so you yeah. have two inches or so at the base of yeah. soil, but it um. That that's one of the biggest problems with them is if they get over potted, they make a lot of babies, make and create more vegetative growth, not the flower. So could it be a dormancy thing? I know I'm wondering too, if yeah, the, if the um, yeah. warm fall we had may have triggered something also. That they stayed active too long? Because they really need to go through, they don't need to get into deep dormancy. <laughs> mine, before were, they actually mine were in the house, and I didn't water them for, oh, I don't know, four or five months. They never did die back. I'm like, stop it. Okay, Christmas so is coming here. We, so then um, they didn't flower. In. No, we they did not. So I wonder and about I mean, that. You really, they really have to yeah. go into deep dormancy. We always turn they them on do. their side. Yeah. Somehow the turning the bulb on its side will help trigger it into a deeper dormancy. You have to force them. Yeah. <laughs> force them to go to sleep. And I would definitely <laughs> repot them every year. Repot them even if even if the same pot is the right size. Change the soil out mm-hmm. like the top third, like like she was saying, t- the top third of the bulbs should be up above the soil surface. Don't put okay. them too deeply. Yeah. Or like Teresa said, you'll get a lot of leaves. Yeah, yeah, but good. But stick with it, Fred. They're oh, great yeah. plants. They'll get mm-hmm. bigger and bigger every year. Oh yeah. Great. And on line five, we have Cindy from Glen Arm, and you have a question about Rex begonias. What's your question, Cindy? Yeah, my Rex begonias do great outside all summer. Mm-hmm. And then I try to bring the pots in and winter them over indoors, and they just, continue to go downhill <laughs> as I bring them in. I don't overwater them or anything, but they just, the leaves start to turn brown and I lose them a couple leaves at a time. Mm. And like in a couple weeks, they're dead and I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. Like maybe it's too cool in the house or something. It's a good question. A lot of us like to bring in our summer plants mm-hmm. indoors. I would think it think? wouldn't be too cool in the house. I think it might be too dry in the house. Um, also, all that summer growth that's been outside, and even if you have them in a really sunny window, the foot candles of light is so much higher outside, even under a shade tree, than it is inside, no matter how big your window is. So here's what I've had good luck with. Cut them off, and they look horrible. Um, I don't know if anybody else here has done this or not, but if you keep having trouble with this, cut most of the growth off until you get down to just where little pieces are trying to come out, new sprouts. Put it in a sunny window, don't water it. You can even put it on a tray of pebbles with a little water in them, not with the pot in the water, but just to provide some extra humidity because it's usually if people have forced air heat, it's too dry in your house. And begonias like it, you know, they like a, a shady, cool place. So I don't think it's too cold unless you live in an igloo, um, but it's probably too hot and dry. So try, try that. You're no better off. I mean, if they die, they're already dying. And what I have found is if I give it some scientific neglect that way, they usually just sprout back out and they do beautifully. But that new foliage can acclimate to the, vi- the environment it's growing in. The old foliage is used to being in that brighter sun outside and it comes in the house and it's like, oh God, it's horrible in here. And it just gives up. So you could try that. Okay, great, great. Hope that helps. And I, we're going to go to our emails here. So, uh, Marty, do you have an email for us? Or? I do. I have an email. Ah, hedge trimming. Our viewer has a 50 foot long hedge that's mostly privet, but some other things mixed in, like wajila and burning bush. It's gradually grown about shoulder high and difficult to trim, <laughs> as I can imagine. I heard you can cut them back severely in October and They'd like to cut off about a foot. They sent this in the fall, in November, and said, now that it's November, can I still do this? I'll tell you what, Elizabeth, 
if this was a November show, I would have said, no, don't do it now. <laughs> You're better off to wait. Not today when it's in the single digits, but pruning later in the season. But the problem is with a mixed hedge like that, I have a photograph, but I don't know if you sent it. Uh, I have a photograph of a hedge, but Wajila, I think you're better off to leave it until spring, until the leaf breaks out so you know where it died back to because it suffers a lot more from dieback than the privet and the euonymus, the burning bush, will do. So, in fact, I would recommend if it's a, if it's a pruned, like a sheared hedge, you want to get the Wajila possibly dug up, separated, put it in its own place. So, um, let's see if that'll help. Okay, so wait till spring. I would, okay. yeah, till late winter at least. Good. And then you have a show and tell for us. Yes. Uh, this afternoon I brought in some of our pussy willow. We grow uh, four Beautiful. different varieties of willow. This uh, particular variety of pussy willow is the giant. And this time of year in January, the catkins are pretty small. Um, if we so waited to let this um, go through the winter in April, the when they start to naturally uh, pop open, they'll be the size of your thumb. So it's a big okay. difference between now and then. Um, we grow this up to uh, eight foot branches. And this is what we call a tip grade, which is generally two to four foot. And uh, so it's one of our spring flowering branches. Next month we'll be doing the forsythia and quince. So uh, if you've got pussy willow out in your yard, go ahead and cut them and put them in some warm water and uh, they'll start to pop open for you. Okay, great. Oh, good. Good time to be thinking about bringing in branches. Oh, yes. And so you, you have, have a show and talk for us as well, yes. Teresa. I can go through this fairly quick. We have somebody who has a hibiscus and they want to keep it around and they want to take cuttings. And I do this kind of stuff all the time at work when I do cuttings and I'm sending stuff with people. I make a mini little greenhouse out of a Ziploc bag. Mm -hmm. But we took a cutting off of our hibiscus. And you want something that's about four to six inches, not flowering. You do not want a flowering tip at all on your hibiscus. And I use just basic rooting hormone, the number one strength. This is something you can buy locally. Anything stronger, you usually have to get on the internet. Um, if the leaves are too large, you can cut and tear leaves. Don't be afraid. I put it in a little paper cup with a drain hole, the wet media, and all I'm doing is then I'm gonna stick it into the bag try to get a little air in with it and blow it up so we can sit it in a bright but not direct sun. If you get a little condensation during the day, you're fine and give it a couple week, 10 days. You should see some root initials coming out. Once it gets rooted well, transplant it. Once the root initials are there, you can take it out of the bag. But it's an easy way to start cuttings okay. and cuttings are the way you would wanna do this. I would wait another couple weeks until the weather's a little brighter, a little nicer, but I take cuttings of all kinds of things all the time. You can do them at home. You don't have to have a fancy mist house. Okay, great thing to do with your house plants this time mm -hmm. of year. You think? Yes. Good. Oh, Very good. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go back to our line. And on line six, we have Derek from Decatur and you have a question about a flower. What can we do for you, Derek? Oh, thank you, Sandy. Uh -huh. This is Derek from Decatur. I have uh, a galvanized horse trot and I wanna try to fill it up with potting soil and grow roses. Oh. Is that, can I do that? What do you think? Put holes in it. I think if it's got drainage, yeah. yeah. go for it. Put I would use some compost. It's I just wouldn't an use oversized. Just, you know, it's a, just an oversized container. container. Actually, it's kind of the in thing now yeah. is to have some of those yeah. big yeah. horse troughs and things. Just make yeah. sure it has good drainage. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd punch right? some holes from the inside through, mm -hmm. like, you know, dime size anyway. Yeah, it should be great. Good, good idea. Pretty great. too. And Send we're going to do a real quick, a quick call. And on line two, we have Claudia. Yeah, from Danbo. You have a question about sugar maples. Do you have a quick question for us? It's very quick. Good. Uh, bark is falling off on the south side. This is a tree that's forty years old. Oh. Um, is it damaged? Can I wrap it? Is it too late? Okay. What do I do? Bark falling off on a it's, sugar maple. It's dead. 
It, not good, is it? No. no yeah, not, not good. Not, not uh, it, it, I mean, part of it could happen on one side and still maybe from some old damage or something, but that's something that's going to be a wait and see till spring, it's see what happens on yeah. how well. You'll find out in the spring how well it leaves out. And you're not that's a tough one. Wrap or yeah, and there's, once it happens, it happens. Yeah. So you, you if it's know. off, Gosh. Daniel's sticking it back on. You're done. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. okay, okay, very good. And then I don't think we have a, we have time for uh, I don't think we're gonna have time for another caller. So uh, keep in mind that you you can always connect with us on Facebook. You can email us. Uh, I will say next week we're actually gonna have a special caller that's gonna talk about low tunnels on how to get production from your garden twelve months out of the year. Okay, maybe at least nine months out of the year. So <laughs> so stay tuned next uh, next week for that. So thank you all very much. Hopefully everybody gets a chance to start thinking about your garden for next year. Get those garden resolutions in and try something new this year that's the great thing about being a gardener isn't it try something new yeah so thank you all very much have a great week <laughs>